announce the, the next lightning talk. Um, those of you who know me know I'm super passionate about bringing together companies and academics to develop new methods. Um, I would spend my whole life doing that uh, if my family would let me. Um, and so some of you know that uh, WCAI has for a long time had this, what we call the Research Opportunity Program, where a company donates a data set and then we give it to something like eight to 12 academic research teams to try to, just like the NFL gave these data sets to different teams to try to make sense of them, we would give them to academics. And uh, we had done that two times with Electronic Arts uh, when they said to us, we don't want to toss the data over the wall. We have smart data scientists right here at Electronic Arts and we want them to work directly with academics um, and have a close relationship. So we launched um, what we call the Research Collaboration Program um, where a company puts kind of a challenge out there. Uh, we announce it to academics, the academics submit proposals, and then we pick exactly one team to work closely with the company. I'll tell you, the academics hate this because it means less <laughs> opportunities to collaborate with industry uh, than we have through the other program, but it's been super successful. Um, so next we have Jason Park, who is a data scientist at Electronic Arts, and Ryan Dew, who's an assistant professor here at the Wharton School, who are going to tell you about their research collaboration. I just realized I don't have the cooker. have it here. Okay, great. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Jason Park. I'm a data scientist with Electronic Arts, and we publish games. But we publish games not just with um, people under our umbrella. Uh, we publish games in third-party uh, groups as well. And part of that is an ex ever-expanding catalog from myriad studios from all across the globe and across different companies as well. So we have so many, so many games that we've built up in our catalog. It is um, uh, in the hundreds. And we have such a, um, a unique platform, a, a client that people can log into to engage with all the games in the full library. But we put that into a subscription, not just as a storefront, and that is what Origin is. And so we offer a subscription, uh, not unlike um, Netflix or Hulu, where you have a selection of media to consume. Uh, we also have a video game subscription. And the video game subscription is pretty much, you know, it's the same problem. It, your, your catalog is only as good as how quickly you can lift up what matters the most to the player. Um, and the retention is dependent on this. The returning players is, and session days are dependent on this. So we definitely wanted a, a better recommendation. Um, sure, we can show what's latest, what's new, what just came into the vault. But uh, we also want to include something that is very, very personalized, that shows as soon as you open the client, hey, you should try check out this game, try to check out this game. I know you enter the subscription because of this newly launched game, but have you tried this? You know, uh, I'm sure like HBO, they've got a spike because of Game of Thrones, and what's gonna happen after Game of Thrones uh, is over, right? Uh, we want to lift up other catalogs, other interesting things that make the subscription worthwhile. And to do that, uh, we came to WCAI and uh, we asked, um, is there some insight and research that academia can provide us? And so, to that end, um, the reception was huge. Um, we didn't think we'd get as much of an, as big of an interest, um, a lot of attendees, and from that, uh, 15 proposals that came straight at us. <laughs> and a lot of reading and a lot of very, very innovative, very interesting uh, papers out there. Um, things that were very, uh, uh, we love complicated, but we also want to do business. We want to implement it. So scalability was, was, was something that was always conscious. Um, of course, we want novelty. Um, and also, we want something that we could tweak to our own business purposes. Um, we, our strategy may change here and there, 
um, and we wanted different objectives that we can optimize on. And so we thought, after reading all the papers, um, uh, Ryan Yegor in his students' paper um, just struck us as hitting these major things um, as, as applicable, and we leaned on the genius of Ryan and company to do that for us. Cool. So. Uh, thanks, Jason. So I should say uh, to Ellie's introduction that academics may have, uh, other academics may have disliked this format in the sense that they weren't chosen, but we really liked uh, this <laughs> format because uh, this was an amazing, an amazing opportunity to work both closely with Jason and to have it facilitated with WCAI to do a lot of really cool, uh, really cool innovations in the recommendation systems world. And so this is an amazing opportunity. I want to start by saying, uh, 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 Jason's already said kind of who we are, but just to, oops, just to give a little bit more context. So like Ellie said, I'm a professor here at uh, Wharton, and uh, my co-authors are Yegor, uh, who is here in the, the back. He's a PhD student at Columbia Business School. He's really been one of the driving forces behind this project. And uh, Saman Sari, who's a professor at Columbia Business School. And so, uh, like Jason said, our task coming into this was to kind of, uh, uh, kind of build out their recommendation system for this origin platform. And uh, from a researcher's perspective, the goal really is to, for any player who comes onto that origin platform, to be able to understand that player's preferences over the whole assortment of games that EA offers through that platform. It's a pretty big uh, task, right? There's gonna be tons of users, tons of games, so we wanna form an ordering over that whole set of games for any person. What that basically looks like is like this. We have a bunch of players, they come in, they play games at various points in time, and we wanna come up with a ranking. Say for user one, that person's gonna prefer game one over game two over game five. For user three, that person's gonna have a totally different set of rankings. Of course, this poses some, some challenges. I mean, recommendation systems have been around for a while. There's some standard algorithms to do that, but EA was particularly interested in a few aspects of the recommendation system problem. Uh, the first is what's called the cold start problem. So EA's platform is growing. There's constantly new users coming into the origin platform and new games being added to the origin platform. That makes it really tricky to figure out what uh, games we should recommend to these new people for whom we have very little slash no data, or for these new games that come onto the platform, who should we recommend those games to? The second big problem was, was actually, actually an opportunity, maybe, uh, rather than a problem, this idea of learning from diverse data sources. So EA was particularly interested in leveraging kind of all of this data that exists out there uh, in social media, on critic review platforms, on game review platforms, to try to better understand people's preferences uh, and to make these recommendations. And so how can we fuse data from this kind of unstructured textual world, textual world to the recommendation system? The final key challenge was uh, recommendation variety. And so let me give you a kind of a sense of what, what this looks like. Suppose we have some user who's come on to Origin and they're just playing the same game over and over and over, say it's Battlefield here. And now we have the opportunity to recommend this person to play something new. If we're gonna just base our recommendation on what that person is likely to play, of course that person is likely to play Battlefield, right? They've played this game a million times, they're gonna play that game again. From a business angle though, that might not make a lot of sense. Maybe that user's sick of playing Battlefield, or maybe that user hasn't explored the full catalog of options that EA has, such that if we had recommended a different game, maybe Dragon Age, that person would take the bait, play Dragon Age, and become a more engaged user for the platform. And so, how can we encode this idea of variety into the, into the model, into the recommendation system? How can we encourage the recommendation system to explore the full set of options that are available? To tackle this uh, 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 challenge, we uh, took an approach which, which I'm calling, or what we're calling, a user game match score approach. And I should say, uh, this is probably gonna be, so we're all, we're all analytics nerds here. This is gonna be the, uh, the, the most hardcore of nerdy uh, uh, slides here in a couple, uh, for the next few slides. So the intuition uh, behind our model is that if we see some user play a game at a given point in time, that means that that user chose to play that game versus all the other games in the catalog. Makes sense, right? So that user chose to play game X over any other game that was available to that person at time T. From a kind of uh, economics-y perspective, if you will, that means that users, that user's utility, the value or the match score between that person in that game 
was higher than that user's match with any of the other games. That's how we're kind of capturing this idea of preference ordering. Uh, more specifically, uh, or, or rather what that means is the problem of estimating these rankings then boils down to a problem of estimating these scores. So once we know the scores, we know everything. And so the question is, how do we actually figure out what those scores are? And that's the model. So the model is based on this idea of, of data fusion through neural networks. That is, we have a bunch of data about the games, we have a bunch of data about the people, we have a bunch of data about the choice context, like all that text from social media. What we're gonna do is we're gonna take all that data, we're gonna fuse it through a set of neural networks to learn an embedding that represents that person's preferences, which we can then use to create a ranking over all of the available games. And now I'm not gonna talk in too much detail about what all of the ingredients of this are, I'm just gonna hit on a few key points. So the first question you might ask is, what actually is this data? What is this data that we're leveraging? What are we using to, to, to do this? And so here's a, a few of the kind of key ingredients here. The first, obviously, is just about what the user's done in the past. I've already kind of said, and you can probably imagine, that what's most predictive of what somebody's gonna do tomorrow is what they did today, the game that they like to play today. And so we encode that both with information about the games that a person has played and with specific timing information, things like recency, frequency, how long has it been since a user played a game, how many times did that user play a game in the past. We also have all this cool data like Metacritic data which captures numeric ratings from other uh, gamers and critics. That information has time associated with it, when did these people rate these things, and text, the actual text of what these people said. And so we're gonna try to fuse all of these things, or we tried to fuse all of these things together to come up with an idea of when or what game a person is going to like to play at a given point in time. How do we actually learn the parameters of this network? So uh, uh, I would feel like a, like a, you know, like a sham uh, 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 analytics person, professor, if I didn't put one equation on the slide, so here we go. Uh, so this is, uh, we leverage this kind of cool technology uh, which is called the Bayesian Personalized Ranking Loss. This is basically a loss function that can be used with any kind of standard neural network type model, which encodes the following idea. What we really want our model to be able to do is to pick which game a person is gonna like to play. That's what this thing here in the, in the, in the brackets is capturing. It's capturing what is the probability that the model will choose the wrong thing. That is, will choose a game that the person doesn't actually like versus a game that that person actually played. And so by minimizing this thing, we can learn the parameters of a network which creates a ranking. It's a really cool technology. If you're into this space, uh, it's, it's something that's worth, worth checking out. In terms of what actually comes out of this, well, of course, it's a set of rankings. But what's actually more interesting to think about is the process, the building up from uh, the data to the final model. What did we learn and what kinds of things really mattered for making recommendations to people? Some of these things are obvious, so I'm not gonna go through line by line by line kind of in the, in the table here, but you can see as we've added ingredients to the models over time, both uh, in things that we thought would be valuable and in things that Jason and team thought would be valuable to include in the model, we see that the, uh, the, the, the performance has improved. And that improvement comes in a few uh, different ways. By the way, I should say, uh, uh, the numbers in the table, is this thing called the mean reciprocal rank, it doesn't really matter what that is, it basically, higher numbers are better. So when we're looking at the table, higher numbers are better. better. And what we see, the first most obvious thing that we see is that behavioral data is still king. No matter what kind of contextual data we put into this thing, behavioral data is really kind of the dominant force, and this is what we should expect. If we found something different, that would be kind of weird. Adding specific or explicit game-specific recency and frequency really helps. That is, capturing how recently somebody has played a game is a good proxy for if they're still engaged with that game. And if you capture that, that means that's what the person is likely to, to play next. If you look down here, somewhat at least disappointing in first glance is that by adding kind of this, at least this initial pass of, of Metacritic data in the bottom two rows of the table, this is that kind of unstructured contextual data. We see that the model's not like doing it a ton better, which at first pass is kind of disappointing to us. Until we think back to one of our key challenges from the beginning, that idea of the cold start problem. What we've realized in exploring these results more is having that extra data about what a game is captured by what critics are saying about it, what other gamers are saying about it, and all of this kind of unstructured text is super useful for actually figuring out what, uh, who's going to like playing a new game that's just been added to the catalog because it gives us a ton more information about what that game is all about. 
Finally, just a, a, a couple uh, final notes about, about what came out of this project. Again, besides for kind of the model, which we've handed over to, to Jason, and he's gonna talk about implementation in just a second. One of the main things that actually stuck out to us is that capturing these dynamics in people's preferences is super important. So people's preferences do change, and leveraging those changes in preferences over time is, is, is important for getting recommendations right. Uh, I feel embarrassed by our graphs after the beautiful plots in the, in, the, in, the previous, in the previous lightning talk. We have no cool animations to show. So at the top, we're just showing that over time, the correlation between your preferences goes down. So what you liked at the beginning is not what you liked at the end. The second cool thing that we've, we've uh, innovated on a little bit is this idea of adding stochasticity. That is not just kind of capturing a point estimate of what someone's preferences are, but approaching this in a, what we're calling kind of a quasi-Bayesian way, that is capturing the uncertainty we have about people's preferences as well. Mm -hmm. And what this facilitates is this, facil you can see first, uh, this is comparing the two approaches, the Bayesian one at the right. We can see that the variance around any given preference estimate is a lot bigger when we do this. Makes sense, That's the, that, that was the whole point. But what this enables is this actually enables the model to do a better job of exploring the space of games. That is, since there's this big band around preferences, the model is kind of exploring in a, in a more principled way. It's going where there is a high variance, where there's a chance that it might do a better job. And so this is a cool thing, uh, uh, something that we're also still, still working. Finally, uh, one of the reasons uh, academics get into these opportunities is, of course, to make a contribution both to the company and academically. And so we're currently working on a paper based on all this stuff. It's a cool thing. Again, I, don't, I guess none of you are academics trying to get in. But from the academics uh, perspective, this is an amazing opportunity to work with real data and make some cool contributions to the literature. And so I'm going to turn it back over to uh, Jason now, who's going to tell you how they've worked to implement our ideas. Thank you. Thanks, Ryan. As you saw, there are myriads and different types of data sets. And not only that, it's gonna be uh, the depth of a data uh, might take a lot of munging and feature engineering and different times, something that's real time that comes from the user in the session and the payload of the request to get the recommendations, um, what happened like in immediately a few seconds before. Um, there will be daily ones that we want to scour perhaps uh, social media and uh, we probably want to uh, uh, transform the, the text into some certain embeddings, some, some things may take much longer. So we want to, to make a system uh, that can um, be conscious of having these disparate ETLs. And not only that, uh, we also wanted to implement something that was, uh, that's using some industry tools. And something that's, uh, that's been um, always on our minds is uh, in previous uh, iterations, we've always been using uh, systems that were very opinionated and very narrow in what you can use. So we are switching um, or planning to switch into uh, a world where we have Dockerized everything and, and driven by Kubernetes. And we could kick it off um, and have the ETLs be managed by uh, things like Jenkins or Airflow. And so as we, as we must, push this into uh, serving the actual recommendations, uh, we can have these trained models doing a hyperparameter grid search and have the models that are the best candidates um, and also split them off into different, uh, different segments, different cohorts for A-B testing and also serve it um, in the... We've got the all. pink version now. Oh yeah, we've got the pink version. <laughs> of, um, we can still serve it as a RESTful API and so that's, that is the um, planned um, implementation. But one thing that you'll note is that what we've leaned on is widely adopted, battle-tested open source tools because that is very fun and interesting for the data scientists, I could tell you, because we're not restricted to a certain language or, or um, a certain uh, template. So um, that is um, our collaboration together, and I want to thank WCAI for making this possible, and I would not have um, met the great genius of Ryan Du, uh, Asim, and Yegor, and so I want to thank um, WCAI for this opportunity. Thank you. Thank you, Ryan. Jason, you want to sit sure. down? It says we have 50 seconds, so I guess we'll make it fast. Oh, apologies. <laughs> um, no, it, they reset it. So oh, okay. uh, my first question is sort of a setup. Did you enjoy working together? 
Absolutely. And so could each of you talk a little bit about what you took away from the collaboration that you wouldn't have gotten if you were working with just with other data scientists at EA yeah. or if you were just working with Yegor? Sure, sure. Um, from our side is we are, um, we are privileged with sitting down, doing a lot of research over extended amount of times. Um, and, but even that is limited. Uh, we still are boots on the ground data scientists in a corporate uh, setting. So uh, we do do a breadth search, and once we find a good candidate, well, we'll do a depth, uh, in depth. But we on can't- On a method, you mean? On a method. Okay. Um, but we can't do that all the time with every single problem because our problems are just so wide and varied. Mm -hmm. So we, we always wanted to um, uh, lean on academia to see if they can explore for us. And, so and, you've uh, done the breadth search. We think a couple of these things might be worth a depth search, and sure. then you get Ryan to go get Jaeger to read the papers to make sure <laughs> that they know exactly what's going on in the field, right? Is that more or less it? Yeah, and so the cool part of this collaboration from, a, from an academic's perspective is the fact that it's, it's a dialogue. So yeah. we would come up with kind of a solution and realize that it actually needs something that wasn't available initially in the, in the data, the initially like proposed yes. data. And so we'd yes. go to Jason and we'd say, hey, you know, there's this cool idea. Uh, we think it's going to play well in your recommendation system. It also helps us make a, a cooler paper out of this. What do you think? You know, can you can you give us this data? And so, uh, uh, different from kind of other opportunities that I've that I've that I've had the chance to work on, mm -hmm. this really is a is a back and forth where we produce something or we hopefully produce something that's uh, useful for for Jason and EA, and also kind of let us fully explore the the the, the set of possibilities for doing this kind of stuff. Yeah. Great. So. Um the project sort of strikes me uh, because you are definitely implementing this in user-facing software. Mm. So the goal, you know, when I was trained as an analyst, we would analyze the data and then present insights to human beings who would sure. somehow change the world. Sure. Uh, but you're actually going to change how the site works uh, sure. based on this. Um, can you talk a little bit more about? how you have to think about things when you know you're building a model that's going to be deployed in that way? Yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, that's part of the uh, selection criteria for even the proposals was, can this be scalable? Uh, is this feasible? Because um, at, at the end of the day, that's what we wanted with this collaboration. So um, yeah, the, the considerations are still there, scalability, uh, reliance. Um, but there's also um, cases where we can fall back into um, just the most popular, if, if the service fails and things like that, there's a lot of uh, uh, unit testing oh, that like goes on. like having a backup plan? Like if Ryan's system starts making weird recommendations, we'll just default to sure, sure. what's the most popular game. I mean, <laughs> there, there, there definitely will be uh, system rules put in place. Like um, if they just made the purchase a minute ago, then we want to remove it from the tiles and things mm. like that. So there, there are some um, ways that can fall back, but in general, we do want a system where it's uh, you know, language agnostic. We can try a lot of different things. Um, and we want it to be um, as, as plug and play as possible because we do want to try a myriad of things, including uh, Ryan's recommendation, yes. So, so did that, that plan, that this was what was going to happen to this model, did yeah. that color how you approached the project, Ryan? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, uh, well, first, we realized that this was the goal, right? So we wanted to make sure that, that uh, when we're coming up with the idea that we suggested it in a way that's going to be uh, implementable. So for instance, we're leveraging kind of all open source things. We're using PyTorch, for instance, for, for learning these, these networks. And uh, a second kind of part of our proposal that we, we viewed as fundamental to the proposal was actually how could it actually be implemented. So while our framework uh, does have like an extended training time, the, the test time, meaning the way it would actually be used in practice is really fast, which is a kind of like a, a key consideration for thinking about actually using this recommendation. So it takes a while to learn, but it's fast to, to once use. it's learned, it can exactly. give the recommendation to a new customer. We have a bunch of like practical questions from the audience. Um, <laughs> Uh, how does your model perform, I guess Ryan can answer this, how does your model perform compared to just using the most popular games? Uh, so some of the uh, uh, recommendations, I don't know if we have that specific statistic on the slide, or maybe Yegor yeah. knows the number, but I, uh, we, we did extensive benchmarking against these yeah. things. So uh, uh, we started out by just thinking about suggesting a random game. We moved to doing like classic recommendation system sure. things, sure. which is basically like learning 
standard like embeddings like through matrix factorization. And so I don't know what the performance uh, uh, gain is over that particular benchmark, but uh, incorporating this this kind of behavioral data through this framework led to boosts against kind of any standard any standard approaches that we tried anyway. Great, um, Jason. Uh, there's a question that a lot of people are interested in which is uh, for the multiplayer games, do you actually think about multiplayer dynamics and network effects in the recommendations? Definitely, definitely. We leverage your friends list and the people that you frequently um, play with. So if the best advocate is probably your friends and family for, uh, for you to jump into this game. So that's also a feature that um, uh, we can put in. And that's why we, we loved um, uh, Ryan's proposal is that it was extensible and we can expand the feature space to include that. And so uh, definitely uh, friends, family, your network um, is very important. All right, I have one last question. Uh, we're way over time, but I don't care. Uh, <laughs> so um, I recently saw a talk uh, from Penn Medicine where they were talking about rolling out uh, basically treatment recommendation models within the Penn Medicine system and they had thought quite a bit about how they were going to gauge whether a model is working or not working. Mm -hmm. Have you thought about that in this case? Will that be part of part of the rollout is to actually measure if the algorithm is producing the customer effects you want? Absolutely, we'll, we will be doing A-B tests. Um, and we will On be- On like Brian's algorithm versus another one? Yes. Great. And so um, that will be, um, that will be one of the major deciding factors. It may not even be the end all and say all um, because we do, well, it's not as pertinent in this type of problem, but there has been applications in A-B testing where it kind of compromises the quality of the product. And so, but I don't think there is a risk for that here. Right. So, so um, but yes, And definitely. what's the KPI for that? Oh yeah, that's, so the, we, we have um, uh, two uh, ones. Um, one is, um, of course, you know, your typical click-through rate um, or, but we also are very considerate about the breadth of the, how wide can you hit the catalog? Because we don't want to just promote EA games. Like I mentioned, we also have third party games uh, that are available. So it, it, we don't want to be so restrictive. We want people to explore more. And also we, we also want to um, en entertain or help our um, third party um, uh, partners as well. So we want um, not just uh, like specific discrimination and very, very, very accurate click-through rates, but also um, we want people to explore. Great. Yep. All right, well, let's uh, thank Ryan and Jason. Thank you.